let's talk about TV everywhere. Um, I, wasn't, I'm not, I wasn't at the National Cable Show, but apparently uh, Brian Roberts from Comcast spoke yesterday. He kind of admitted that things are going slower than people would like. I think we've heard some, some other cable execs talk about that. What, what, what do you guys think is holding up this endeavor? I mean, it, it's, it's a concept more than actually a real initiative, I think, right? But what, what's, what's, taking, what's taking long, if, if, if you think it is? Uh, you want to start or? Well, if Brian Roberts said it, I fully agree. Let me go on record as. <laughs> well, first of all, I think it's two things. It's technically hard, and there's a lot of business considerations. And, you know, these things will be resolved at some point. But I think that's, I, and I think the business considerations are probably a little even more difficult than the, uh, than the technical Jeez. ones. But those things will be resolved, and I think it's pretty clear this will be a very, very important way in which people will consume video. What's, what's technically hard about it? Is it the actual, um, it's, it, it seems it can be very technically difficult for consumers, but is it actually, you know, making sure that you pay for cable? It's, it's actually easier for consumers than it is for the, for the cable guys. I mean, look, I'm not an engineer, so yeah. I'm mean, the last person to talk about it. One of the big issues has been what's called authentication, which is back in, which means that you have to register in some way with your MVPD provider in order to have, have access to this. And we learned in the early days of this, we do a lot of work on cross-platform content uh, at the Olympics, because it's a great sandbox. It's a huge amount of content over 17 days, and there's, a, and there's a, a lot of consumer use. We learned back in Vancouver, when it was really the first time we were trying to authenticate, that almost 80% of people who tried to authenticate, enabling them to watch streaming video of the Olympics, were unable to do so and basically got frustrated and left. And that's just something that is intolerable because obviously these were guys who wanted to be there and couldn't. This thing has improved tremendously since then. But again, a lot of it tends to be um, you know, very specific to the MVPD. There are some who are more advanced in both the way in which they authenticate and the way in which they can throw content onto a variety of platforms, including tablets, and others who are more behind. But I think it's all gonna catch up. I mean, I'd also jump in and say, I think this concept of authentication has given it a word that may not mean what it actually is, right? Because you're talking about specifically two different rights, the in-home right to view content, and then there's this out-of-home right uh, to view content. And I know the MVPDs would like those to be one right that they pay uh, one time for, and you know, maybe if the rates are accurate for your network or your, <clears throat> your service, that makes sense. But you know, for some of us that hasn't necessarily made that, pro that business issue that you talk about really uh, work for us. And so, I mean, I think some of us have made strong businesses distributing catch-up content online and on tablets via video on demand, you know, the day after air and, and a few days after air distribution. And those are real businesses now that, that supply content on that catch-up basis uh, and, and make good money for us. So it's very hard for us to then go say, look, sorry, you're going to have to log in with this password you don't remember in order to get this content, which means the audience is going to decline by like 90% for the first few years and you're going to make no money. Right. So those of us with, with strong dual revenue stream models have to really consider, have to take those business considerations into, into account as we look at how we roll out the concept of TV everywhere. I think live linear uh, might be a different story, but, uh, and that we're really waiting for measurement to catch up because you can't really measure you know, Nielsen viewership on a tablet and therefore it's very hard to do that live linear distribution and make it count. Uh, but on the VOD side, I think the holdup is that there are, are strong models online and on tablet today for that catch-up video that make it hard to, you know, to go behind a wall and make that, that viable. Why, why does it, this might be an ignorant question, but why does, it, why does the in-home thing matter? If, if I pay for cable, why, did, why, does, why, do they, why is it diff, why can't I log in wherever I am? What does it matter that I'm in my house or not? I mean, I guess it's an assumption that when you bought cable, you thought you were getting those rights? You thought you were going to be able to take it everywhere. Well, I mean, if I'm if I'm going to stream something on my iPad and then it's, what does it matter? What does it matter that if in if in if in my apartment or at the office? Like, what does it matter to my cable company and you guys? I'm it paying, is, right? I'm already paying. It's the business consideration. In exactly. other words, it's all about rights. I mean, in other words, what's going on now is that when programming is produced, there's a huge amount of conversation about exactly who owns the rights to do all these different things. I mean, technically, you're right. There's no reason why you can't be, you know, have your home here in New York and you're in Kansas City and you're watching something on your tablet as long as you're authenticated and you're doing it through the Internet. It really has to do with whether or not the rights to that have been granted. And to be fair, 
program producers and a variety of other people who were in the chain are getting increasingly savvy about the idea of withholding those rights so they can monetize them. So it's just a complicated thing. You probably should have had a lawyer on this panel because they're right. probably going to have, well, maybe not. I'm sorry. I'm only kidding. Now I've gone too far. Right. But. Yeah. I, I always wonder why doesn't, you know, I think you, you mentioned the hurdles that you guys faced in, um, with, with the Olympics. I, I wonder, first of all, I should ask you, I wonder if you guys saw, because in the last couple of years, CBS has, um, required you to authenticate to watch March Madness, right? Where that used to be wide open for free. Have you faced the same kind of hurdles? Did you see a big audience fall off from that? So the truth is CBS has actually never required you to authenticate to watch the game that's on CBS. We've always made that game available for non-authenticated viewership, so for free viewership. Turner, in our partnership with Turner, they have right. uh, the authentication hurdle, and so the games that have been on the Turner set of networks have always been authenticated. And I know right. that's- This isn't confusing at all. I'm not confusing, right. totally simple, right. but no. But look, you're, at least we're giving you, you know, we're giving you one application, we're giving you one site to go to at this point, right, ncaa.org and, and the app that was around March Madness were one thing this time. The question was, did you have to have that, that login credential to go get that game? Yeah. And look, you, you know, I think the lesson learned from the first year to the second year of doing it in that format was, let's give people some opportunity to do it for free first. So there was some free hours okay. that were there, you know, to start. And then there was a paid option that if you right. couldn't do it uh, through your, your cable provider, you could pay to have access. And um, to be frank, you know, we saw frankly more, uh, almost more paid access than logged in access. <laughs> so I, I think that it shows that the hurdle for authentication is really getting people, I don't know if it's to memorize a password or make that authentication something uh, easier for them to achieve. I think some of the operators are actually working on this where you're, if you're in your home um, and you're on your home network, that authentication is automatic. You don't actually have to have the, the login credentials. So as that stuff gets easier, I think those models will, will be more robust. And look, if the audience were behind the wall, uh, you know, I'm not sure CVS would have a, a significant issue right. with being behind the wall. It's the fact that the audience has trouble getting there that, that makes the ad business look, look a little rough behind it. On that note, why not? I, I, I I'm pretty sure this, you guys have all talked about this. I don't know if it's held up or if it never went anywhere, but why not have Facebook become the login for everybody? Nobody has to remember, remember what provider they have, what their, their weird password is for Time Warner. Login with Facebook wherever you are. Wouldn't that be easy? I, I mean, think you're missing one really key panel yeah. member to answer that question, which is an MVPD, exactly. list operator. Yeah, I don't right. think that falls within their business model. Well, I'm blaming whoever's in front of me for these, for the, uh, for these problems. I think only um, one of us here has an MVPD in the family, so. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Would that make sense, Alan? Would that? Well, first of all, or not every, believe it or not, I know you won't believe this, not everybody in this country is on Facebook, number one. And secondly, I mean, the, I know it sounds crazy because it does to me, like why this authentication thing is so difficult, but believe it or not, when it came to Vancouver, which is only two years ago, you had to know, in many cases, your cable subscription number. Now, who knows that? I mean, you know, you know your phone number, but you don't know your cable number. And we had many people say to us, I don't pay my bill. I mean, my bill get paid by auto pay. I haven't seen right. a cable bill. I mean, it's crazy stuff. And you would say, well, why? But I have to say, you know, it has gotten a lot easier. I mean, I I'm a Fios customer only because I don't live in the Comcast footprint. Let me make that plain. But <laughs> in order to authenticate on, say, you know, HBO Go, it's really easy. I type in my name, I have a password, and I'm done. So I think it is moving along. And uh, as you say, I, I, I think that it just, it just seems counterintuitive. But you have to remember one thing about this kind of rat's nest of stuff. Almost every MVPD is a combination of many, many, many legacy systems that were combined year over years and years and years. And even a company like Comcast, which is huge, the number one cable provider in the country, still has many, many different systems that don't always speak to each other. And it makes it apparently very difficult to have what might seem to be very simple user-friendly solutions to actually be developed. It's a much more difficult task. It's why one of the reasons why guys like uh, Satellite tend to be a little bit more advanced and things like this, simply because they started with one kind of infrastructure, whereas all of the MVPD cable guys are really a combination of many legacy systems over the years. Now again, as we move entirely to digital, many of these problems are being resolved, but you can't really talk about things like multi-platform, cross-platform tablets and things like that without being cognizant of the fact that there's this underlying infrastructure that really has to support it, and it's just difficult. So, I mean, all kidding aside, I think that's what Brian was referring to. They're working very, very hard to, as they say, harmonize all these different systems, but it just is a lot more difficult than a layperson like myself mm -hmm. who's not an engineer would really understand. 
I think there's also one very important factor, which is content for the consumer. Like if there is a value equation, a la for sports, they will find a way to remember that cable number and put that in. Right, but you gotta watch the game, you gotta figure something exactly, out. Exactly, right? you will figure something out. But if that, if that content is freely available somewhere else and they don't have to jump through hoops to get to it, mm -hmm. they're not going to go through the hoops then. And I think that's where it's making a big difference too. It's what am I getting as a consumer yeah. in order to give all this information mm -hmm. to you, sit down and go through this process. Right. Now, you, you were just at E3, you just got back mm -hmm. today. In fact, uh, could Xbox, serve as like the, 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 the facilitator of all this stuff? Do you see huge potential there? I think there's a huge promise there. I think uh, the direction in which they're going with all the content um, and uh, now being able to also access um, all the cable and broadcast through one box, I think that's a huge promise, especially for families, even though it seems like a very steep price today at $4.99. Um, it, it just the convenience of having everything come together um, I, I think there's definitely a promise there. Right, and, and they seem to not want to fight cable. They want to work with them, right? Exactly. They They're them working with them. Um, I think we, we're, we're going to get in trouble if we don't talk about tablets a little bit more. Um, let's bring the conversation back there. You know, there's there's so much there's been so much talk in the last couple of years about with with the growth of tablets, uh, social TV or co-viewing or whatever you want to call it. I wonder how how much of that is people sitting in front of the TV with their tablet looking at email or doing other things, or looking weird stuff up versus actual like real co-viewing where they're watching some, they're using, they're consuming some kind of complimentary content. Well, um, it, it, it depends upon the nature of the content. I can yeah. talk about the Olympics, for example, which I think is the gold standard for that. 52% of people who were watching with some other device were watching the Olympics on TV and watching, you know, and, and consuming Olympic content on either, an, you know, in some cases it was they had in one hand, you know, an iPad, uh, an iPhone, an iPad, and a uh, and a laptop. But the Olympics is very special because it, it lends itself right. to that. Sports tends to because you can be looking at stats and things like that. I can't imagine people wanting to watch, you know, SVU and being on their tablet, you know, you know, trying to figure out what the case was. I mean, that's unlikely. But the reality is that. Over half of people who watch TV today, and, and just think about yourselves, watch it with some other device in their hand. To be fair, lots of times they're surfing the web and doing other things. The holy grail for all of us, you know, um, content providers would obviously be if there was a combination between, you know, what they're seeing on the big screen and what they're seeing on another platform. But it's difficult because not every genre works the same. But one thing I would just mention to give you some sense of how amazing this tablet is, is that about 30, 35 percent penetration of tablets right now in this country after about three years. That is twice as fast as the DVD penetrated in three years and four times as fast as the VCR. So I don't think there's any question that the tablet's going to be huge. And one of the ways that we measure this is by looking at it during this Olympic time. So, you know, there was a lot of tablet use in London, but as far as I'm concerned, that's going to grow incrementally for two reasons. Number one, more people are just getting tablets. And secondly, there's more tablets to get. We were just talking before, mm -hmm. there's a great Surface, you know, yeah. Windows tablet, which is a n another way to go, and mm -hmm. there are the Samsung <clears throat> tablets. So I don't think there's any question that the tablet is going to be a hugely important aspect of consumer, you know, consumption of video content. Mm -hmm. My biggest concern for that, and, um, and Mark, you know, mentioned it, is that it isn't currently included in the Nielsen measurement ecosystem, meaning right. it's right. not in the currency meaning that even though we get paid for some of the stuff that people see, we're not getting the real money, which is in the Nielsen number. And that's something that, you know, obviously has got to get corrected as soon as possible, because the more people enjoy this great experience, the more we lose people. Yeah. I will, sorry. sorry. Um, I will say, though, it's not just the video content that is going on, because people are watching a lot of tent folds. And what we see at least happening a lot more is people being part of the social chatter that is happening. So a lot more on Twitter, yeah. a lot more on other apps where they are participating in a conversation that's happening alongside, not necessarily just an enhanced content viewing experience. Yeah, now I wonder, if does that, does that frustrate TV guys because they're not controlling the social TV conversation? Are you more than happy to let Twitter? No, I mean, look, I think you have to figure out how to build it into the, yeah. the product base that you have. I mean, we, we've, I'll give you three good examples. I mean. As you said, sports content is kind of the best uh, second screen example we have yeah. out in the marketplace today. I'd say fantasy football is the number one 
second screen yeah. thing that you could possibly put out there. I mean, our fantasy football app is constantly on on Sundays while people are watching it and watching sure. scores update. Nothing to do with social, just has to do with them beating their friends and winning the money. Not that we think that there's gambling going on at all <laughs> there. Never. Uh, Never but then, you know, when we launched, relaunched our CBS Sports app, you know, the, the, the key integrating factor was, yeah, we're going to have a game tracker. Yeah, we're going to have all those pieces, but we built in social right into there. And those are Twitter feeds uh, coming right into the app and being able to be viewed as you're watching the game. And so our point was, yeah, we get that Twitter is that utility, but how do we make it part of our experience to, first of all, give us a better experience for the fan, but secondly, give us an advertising opportunity uh, to put things around, you know, our wrapper on. I'd say the Grammys... Um, you know, sort of big event programming comes second behind sports. And so the Grammys, for example, we've built in those feeds uh, since sort of day one about two years ago in terms of putting that second screen experience out there. We're also doing secondary cameras and video feeds, all those pieces. You think about right. what we did for the Super Bowl. I mean, I think part of hitting that social record was building a, you know, it was a six camera feed event, but you know, one of the cameras was always the same as what was on mm -hmm. air. So we're giving you a couple alternatives, but really what people were interacting with was the, the sort of Twitter feed we built into that, that application. Um, and then we also, also done the same thing for prime time uh, as well. We've built the CBS Connect app, which is where you can, you know, sort of build and do social things uh, as you're watching the shows. But you know, the one point, Alan, that you made about sort of people not wanting to watch SVU while, while interacting mm -hmm. socially, we actually do find that, you know, comedies and dramas are definitely third on that list, right? I mean, and that's probably fourth behind reality programming. Uh, but there still are people that want to interact. And so what we've been searching for is, you know, what is the holy grail of getting those people exactly. deep in? And you may not get the huge audience, but you get the super fan mm -hmm. very deep. And so one of the examples, what we've done is built... Uh, what we call second screen sync content. So it is actually synced to the timing that you're watching it on TV. I'll give you the example of NCIS LA where, you know, we're, we're building every two, three minutes, we're, we're pulling up. It's almost like pop-up video. Mm -hmm. And I think we're in iteration one. I mean, some of the stuff is a little bit, you know, lame where you're saying like, hey, look at the car he's driving. It's a, this kind of car. But some of the stuff where we got a full evidence dossier of the NCIS LA crime scene and we're giving you extra photos and things that you can help try to solve it, I think for super fans makes a big difference. And our ability to package that for a sponsor who wants to reach that super fan, you know, I mean, that's a pretty big advantage that we didn't have two, three years ago right. from these technologies. Well, social media is very tricky. I mean, George Burns used to have a statement that said, the secret to success in show business is authenticity. If you can fake that, you got it made. <laughs> the problem with social media is it has to be truly authentic. Yes. You can't fake it because people see through it right away. So you're 100% right. I mean, there are some ways in which you can get super fans and we try to do that, but it's just hard. Yeah. Well, I wonder too, is that is that a more I've heard different different theories on that. Is that a more distracted user that is hard to reach with advertising or is that a much more engaged user and you can reach them on two different screens at once so that's a better opportunity for brands. I mean, my opinion would be it's a much more deeply engaged user you? of the show. I would, say, I would say more deeply engaged. I actually, to your point earlier, I'm not looking at my email right. or playing Candy Crush on my mobile phone. So right. I am a much more engaged user. And we know you're not in the bathroom. And point. you know I'm not in the bathroom. Well, or maybe. Exactly. Maybe. <laughs> so, but I would say Twitter also, I mean, if you saw their Twitter for Brands event, which was a few yeah. weeks ago, they had a lineup of the networks working with them and licensing content and building all kinds of different business models with them. You know, it started with the ESPN with their replay stuff, but so you were, you're seeing that everybody is trying to take advantage of that, that social chatter. What about, is there, is there a lot, because of the measurement thing, is there a lot of money right now going into companion viewing, co-viewing co or whatever, or is it really like I don't experimental? Know if it's a lot of money. I think it's a lot of uh, appetite to learn in that space today. Uh -huh. um, I, I don't think it's scalable, and to your points uh, earlier, we're still learning so much. The things we are doing in that space right now are iteration one or even 0.5. <clears throat> uh, so we're still learning. So it's, it's less about budgets. It's mo a lot more about we're definitely asking for those things as we are finding ourselves in the upfront right now. Mm -hmm and uh, talking about it a lot more, and uh, definitely leaning in on properties like Twitter to help us crack that code. Yeah, the one thing I differentiate is that that, that second screen piece obviously is smaller, and, and how many d you know deep fans are we getting to engage? You know, sort of full episode video distributed across online and mm -hmm. tablet platforms. I think that is a robust model. Even without the OCR measurement, there are, I think, you know, plenty of advertisers willing to purchase that video inventory on a P2 plus basis because it is, you know, deep, you know, it's a deeply engaged user and using it and it is that same full episode video you're buying in a catch up window. So they'll, so they'll, they'll 
they'll go with less than per perfect metrics right now because well, it's that's, I mean, it's a perfect metric. It's just yeah. not demographically right. targeted, right? It, it's right. not a you're not missing Demo impressions. You just yeah. you just can't validate that it's a 18 to 49 year old, you know, male or female. Do you guys think, Alan? You spoke about how fast tablets are growing and they're and the behavior is becoming so commonplace. But do, do you think with with smart TVs and with Xbox and with Apple or whatever they do, could could the co-viewing experience be pulled back onto the big screen at some point? Or could sure. social, social, social TV really, if, you, if you're on a giant screen with that's totally web enabled, is that kind yeah, of... I mean, well, a couple of things. First of all, you know, we're going to look back in 10 years and look at this period of time and it, it's going to say like, oh, what were they thinking? I mean, there was like Particularly so much, panel. so much is changing now so quickly. It just stuns me. And by the way, all the stuff is mainstream. You know, I mean, people who watch, you know, full stream programs on, say, an iPhone, it's not 25-year-olds who live in Soho and wear black. I mean, it really is, you know, <laughs> lots of America. I mean, in other words, there are certain skews. I mean, social media is pretty much a younger skewing thing by and large. But other than that, any of these kinds of, I mean, let's face it, tablets are owned more by older people than younger consumers because they have the money, stuff like that. It's just that the way people are consuming, I mean, now we're looking at the whole Netflix phenomenon. And it's not so much about Netflix as a company. But as but the notion that we're teaching people that there's another way they can consume you know video and whether it's Netflix or Amazon or Intel or you know Apple or who, it doesn't really matter. There's a whole sea change in the way people are thinking about how they approach you know video. Having said that, the more things change, the more they stay the same. I just before I left, we were doing a, uh, a study on millennials, 20, 18 to 24 year olds, because they're not our basic audience now, but they're our future, and we wanted to kind of understand some of this stuff. And interestingly enough. The vast majority of their viewing, and these are kids still, is watched on the big screen. People default to the big screen. Everybody likes to see the best possible, you know, video experience. The only <coughs> difference is that for people now, if you can't see it on the big screen, they have no problem watching on a laptop or on a tablet or on a, on a smartphone or any of those things. So, you know, I mean, that's the way the world is evolving. And what's going to be interesting is to see sort of how it winds up. In other words, what the proportion of all these various media are. I think that, you know, there aren't a lot of smart TVs out there yet, but I see no reason to believe that they won't play a major role because they're just really easy to use. I mean, I, somebody mentioned it's all about the consumer experience. If you make this stuff easy, and people are making it pretty easy, you know, why bother to go, if they want to watch Netflix, and go through an Apple TV or a PS3 when it's there, you know, in an app or an icon right on your TV? So, you know, the problem is, there's too much TV. I mean, I grew up at a time when there were, you know, just a couple of networks and everybody got a 30 share of the audience and went home early. I mean, all that's gone right now. <laughs> uh, there's just a lot of that stuff out there. But more importantly, it's such a cliche, but it's just so true. Consumers totally in control. They, they want what they want, when they want it, and, they, and, and, and they'll find it. And by the way, they'll go to piracy as well. I mean, of yeah. these millennials, one in 10 said piracy is very, very, I mean, the ability to pirate content is extremely important to me. And almost half of them said that sometime over the past month, they couldn't get what they wanted, so they went out and, and pirated it. Yeah. And so, you know, all of us, I'm sure CBS, I mean, you know, we're all having the same question. How much do we put out there and cannibalize ourselves? Because if we don't cannibalize ourselves, somebody else will. I mean, it's just a very, very difficult world today. And so I can't give you, I mean, anybody who thinks they know how it's all going to play out mm -hmm. probably doesn't know what they're talking about. Time is going fast. I have more questions, but. Uh, I want to make sure, that th th anybody in the audience want to jump in? I can barely see. There's somebody in the back. Blind or son. You, then you. Sure. Um, with, the, with the tablet in your hand, is there, is there any evidence that you've seen that suggests that we're using it to view in new ways? So someone on the couch watching the TV, somebody sat next to them, with their head, uh, headphones in and watching a different show, but they're sat together. Whereas before they were being relegated to the little screen in the bedroom. Now the family, having spread out from the, the, ma the main room in the house to lots of different rooms, is now able to all hang out in the same space, physically close, but digitally separate. Well, I'll give you one example of this. We, we, we do this ethnography where we go into people's homes and talk to them. So this guy says he's got a tablet and he's in bed, and his, and his wife controls the big set. And she's watching, you know, something. And he's watching something else with earphones on. And he says, you know, she's watching her thing. I'm watching mine. But we're in the same bed. We're still a couple. So that's... Yeah. I mean, I, I, it happens... 
too much information in our bedroom every night. Um, <laughs> my husband, there are certain shows he only gets to watch them on his uh, iPod, and that's it. I will not be watching those with him on the big screen. So there are certain things that we know we watch together, and there are certain things we go back to our own personal devices for. But you're still a couple. We're still a couple. <laughs> Sir. Yeah, to what extent do you think the ad model for TV is going to change over time? Because clearly there are a lot of commercials that need to be aired to pay for the content. And when you think about the tablet and how it's potentially a much more engaging experience, it's a one-on-one -on -one VOD type of a situation, do you think because the tablet now uh, is capable of addressable uh, advertising, I mean, you know who the device owner is and therefore Maybe publishers can charge higher rates, advertisers are happier because there's less waste, um, and the ultimate, you know, the consumer's gonna have a better experience too because it's relevant, you know, relevant ads. But ultimately, could there be fewer commercials on a tablet, and then it's a win-win for the whole ecosystem? I mean, do you see that happening? Uh, I mean, I go from a technology perspective. We, we see the future where we can tell who the user is before we deliver the ad and really only deliver them that efficient advertising. I think the problem for most of us out there today is that is not the mass of even our online and tablet audience. It's it's only a portion. You know, sometimes it's 10, 15, 20% of that audience that we can really, you know, we know who this is, we know how old they are, we know what sex they are, and therefore we can deliver for that, that advertiser that way. And by the way, that waste, that lack of waste is great for us too. We get more efficient in delivery and can make more money. So every, everybody wins. I, I think we're just, we're probably not far away, I'd say almost you know, 12, 18, 24 months. It's not that far away where that starts to become 50, 60% of your user base. And all of us, I mean, we're sitting there racking our brains of how do we get people to log in? How do we get people to do more things that tell us who they are, which probably pushes the authentication fold and all kinds of other things into the right right path. So, so tablet's great for that, but it's still a very tiny portion of our overall even online audience than related to TV. It's a very, very tiny portion. So we're not quite there. But I, I could see a future where there may be less advertising, there may not. It'll depend on how the, the business model evolves for the programming. But maybe you know. different advertising. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. 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 If because the experience rates and is happen. so different yeah. on tablet. But I will say, just because we are in the midst of the upfront, what is exciting for me is that we are having those conversations now. And the tracks have to be put in place now for us to be able to get to that future. And what is fascinating to me is, one, how much of the digital people have been part of the conversations of all the TV upfronts this year. So, hey, we are at the adult table, mm -hmm. and I love it. <laughs> uh, but also what was fascinating is that the ad ops people have been front and center huh. in the conversations, which is absolutely phenomenal. Because they're the ones who are putting the tracks in place. Those are the ones we are having research guys. Like we are having the conversations about the, the comp validations. What are we going to do? What, how are we going to measure? We're talking about, um, you know, uh, from, from a just, uh, again, laying the tracks. How are we going to understand the mobile audience better? What is that advertising experience there? And the fact that we are having those conversations today, again, I don't think it's more than two years away, but it's fascinating how it's changing. I mean, I've got this vision of, you know, in the old school family situation, people were watching TV, um, the whole, f it was a family experience. The, the next generation, everyone could be in the family room with their own iPads or their tablets, and then, a you know, it's just, it's a sort of a one-on-one -on -one thing. The big screen will be there, but who knows what it's going to look like. Yep. Anyway, it's a fascinating. As long as I don't have to watch The Bastard, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think... I think that's it, uh, folks. Thanks for a great panel, great discussion, and we're we're out of here. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.